I'm pleased to be here tonight. On, this is such a neat occasion. And for me, it's especially uh, exciting because when Hakeem spoke and was, used his special skill set for everyone at the Karen Abram Courtyard dedication, I couldn't be there. For I had a medical situation where I couldn't be there that night or that afternoon, so I missed him. So this is like a makeup for me, and I can't tell you how thrilled I am about that. Rather than bore you with reading the material, I'm guessing that because you're here for a poetry reading, and for poetry, most of you can probably read. So you can, you can, read, you can read all about Hakim. I'm just going to speak louder because I don't like to bend over like that. You can read about Hakim in your program, and if you don't have a program, please get one. If you don't have a program, yeah, I think you can raise your arm and raise your hand, and we'll figure out a way to get you one. Um, I think the really interesting thing is, is that Hakim is truly a treasure of this university and this community. And I think that, you know, so often in the pictures of things where maybe poetry isn't valued the same in the world of in the world as it, as it should be. I think it's especially exciting to have someone with his history and his voice be able to get together with us and share with us his ideas. I'm gonna relate, I wanna do two things. Um, again, we know we're listening to Hakeem. We know I got all these, I bet, this, I bet you haven't had an introduction like this before, Hakeem. <laughs> this, talks, this, talks about, this talks about how important he is to the city. This talks about all the things he's done. This is a quote, direct quote from him, which I'll let him tell you rather than out of my voice. And finally, uh, he his, it talks about his vision. So I'm going to let that's going to be that part. But I want to take a, a moment and to uh, say say a couple of things about the. We have a someone in the audience tonight. I'm going to embarrass him. I'm going to really embarrass him, and that's intentional. Um, we're really lucky in Albuquerque to have one of our UNM alums who came back from Washington, D.C. in seven years with the Foreign Service to serve and has agreed to serve on Tim Keller's uh, staff, uh, be a part of his administration for the city of Albuquerque. So I'd like to ask David Campbell to stand up and be recognized because we're so happy, we're so happy you're back. And, and, and if, there's, if, there's, if there's anything I like to do, it's embarrass somebody. So there you go, I think that makes it really great. Uh, I'd like to also thank the staff. You guys just do a phenomenal job. I make it a point every time that I have the opportunity to speak to a group how important it is for someone like you, for, the, for you guys, to do the things that you do and to be recognized. Because these events come off reasonably flawlessly, reasonably only because nothing's ever perfect, perfect. But you guys do a phenomenal job, and I just want to make sure. Can we give them a, can we recognize what they do? <laughs> So without further ado, what I'm going to do is introduce Kathy, who's going to, and uh, are you going to have, a, are you going to have a, 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 uh, an assistant? Would you like to be my assistant and draw some names for me? I bet he will. Would you do that? Come, would you come up and help us for a minute? This is, how, this is Hakeem's son. Come, would you, we're just going to draw some things out of the thing. About, okay? The drawings, tonight, the drawings tonight are for two of Hakeem's books, which you sat on on the second floor. Bring out your tickets. Take out, and look and see. Is that you? Well, come on up. There you go. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to do one more. Oh, way in the back. All right, come on up. There you go. Well, congratulations. And Hakeem, thank you. Thank you for donating these two bucks to us. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you. Oh, wait a minute. Excuse me, Hakeem. That's it. Back it up. Here we go. We like to get your, we like to get your business cards so that we can update your information. So thank you for those who contributed their business cards. I'll let you draw that. Oops. And you get alumni swag tonight. Dorothy Kerwin. <laughs> okay. And have, I just wanted to, I don't know if you knew, but I wanted to say that David Campbell did a Lobo living room for us. I know he did. And I was, I was there that night. So we, uh, that, you know, recognition is, is especially important. 
Uh, okay, now the, what we've all been waiting for, Hakeem. Hi, everybody. Hi. So, uh, hello, hello. So, um, I heard the gzzz. I feel like the best way to start um, to talk a little bit about my poetic journey as a Lobo is uh, where it all started, at birth. So uh, <laughs> this poem that I'm gonna begin with is about, uh, you know, my medical condition. So I have this problem getting anywhere on time, even though I was here early tonight. And if you are one of those people, please raise your hand. Okay, I'm not alone. This is good, this is called, this is called group therapy. Group therapy, right? And then furthermore, I'm in the land of manana in New Mexico. You know we have a loose relationship with being on time, um, so it just complicates the issue. So the title of the poem is called Chronometrophobia, um, which is not the fear of being late, it's actually the fear of clocks, but you know, clocks and lateness kind of go together, so. <laughs> because she had always been on time, the foreman never so much as flinched at his watch when she had to leave early. She's good labor. Not even a baby can make her late. 90 minutes later, I was born a month early. The lieutenant and my dad was proud that I was on time, military time, for the last time. <laughs> Growing up, always, always told time is not a suggestion, it's a fact. Non-negotiable, so I guess that's why I'm anti-punctual, because clocks make me feel like a hostage the way that they're armed. Skin-flavored nightmares every day at half past black of me as public enemy, neck dangling from an oversized clock. This is the face of chronometrophobia. <laughs> I'm on CP time, New Mexican and Indian time, and frankly, it's sad that that's still not enough time. I can barely keep up time, and it's so sad I still need more. The leash given me by God, family, and friends alone, never by appointment and employer, except for the time when I was 415 Hakeem on my name tag and schedule at Eddie Bauer, but I was proud. <laughs> When their manager proposal began with, he may not come when you want him, but he always shows up. <laughs> I'm not the type to call out. I'm the type that's running behind. Chasing my dreams has me late for their reality. Chasing my future has me late for their now. So just know, when I show up a hair less dressed and stressed, it's simply because I haven't met my future yet. And when they say dumb stuff like, if you would have left 10 minutes earlier, all the lights would have been green, I know exactly what they mean. But when they say dumb stuff like, well, he's the type that would be late to his own funeral, I have no flipping idea what that means. Of course I want to be late to my own funeral. Matter of fact, there'd be a no-show if I have any say in the matter. <laughs> so what if I am too much heart hemmed up to a surplus of sleeve, never cuff link to but covering my forearm foreman so I never know what time to leave? Plus, I already told you about my phobia of clocks. They just remind me that they're all running out of time. And I'm sorry if I borrow a couple of your minutes to enjoy the ride. I'm sorry I try to love everybody at the same time and I didn't prioritize your deadline over my lifeline. I mean no disrespect. And I don't mean to take your time, but I mean to take mine. When I'm late, I hear me ticking, knowing that when I leave, I will not have spent as much time with you as I would have liked. Just like the conversation I haven't seen in forever in the market. The, no mom, this is not a bad time on the phone. The, yes son, I have time for one more video game. The third snooze, the cuddle for breakfast. The best part of waking up is laying next to me in bed. The five more minutes won't hurt that made me late to this. Hi, I'm now 15 Hakeem. Pleased to meet you. And I'm sorry I'm not embarrassed or ashamed, in fact, I feel relieved, even though I just drove 85 miles per hour from wherever I was to be in your presence, and I wish you were all arms and unconditional instead of frowns and perfection, because I'm not God. But just like them folks in the black church say about their God, he may not come when you want him, but he's on time. <laughs> Thank you, Lobo Living Room. Thank you. So, um, so I'm a teacher these days. I teach at a high school in Santa Fe, New Mexico School for the Arts, and I'm the creative writing uh, chair there. And uh, so I know something about people being late, especially to class. 
And so I share that poem with my students the first day of class to get it out of the way, and I tell them that your poetry and excuses won't work on me. So uh, <laughs> we get that out of the way right from the start. I'm like, I got the same condition, and if I can be here, you can be here, right? So, uh, but I, I wanted to just do like a, a, a retrospective, right? I feel like the honor, really, the honor to be here tonight is it's always good to be appreciated by your own. And uh, when I moved here, gosh, 13 years ago on MLK Day, uh, which is odd. You can't, you can't resist the irony of a black guy moving into Mexico on MLK Day. But uh, I'm always like, really, I did that? It's like you show up and your friend's wearing the same outfit. Anyway, um, but when I came here, uh, I was 26, so now you know how old I am. Uh, I'll be 40 in May. And uh, I was living in the dorm because I moved here all the way from South Jersey. I had you know, my closest blood relatives or second cousins in Dallas. Um, a long story about how me and my son's mother thought it would be romantic to move west, applied to three schools, thank God UNM said yes, and I had nowhere else to live. So I was living in um, Coronado Hall, yes. And so like the I, was that, I was the weird 26-year-old guy on the freshman dorm floor, right? <laughs> and um, I was in grad school, um, and I was looking for a work-study job. And I, you know, opened a phone book, not really, because, you know, phone books are a relic of the past, but uh, I was looking for a job, and the first job that came to my attention was the job of news reporter at KUNM. Uh, and so my first three years in New Mexico were as a reporter for the Call In Show, which is now Let's Talk NM. I was actually the call screener, so if you didn't get through, I'm sorry. And uh, being on Street Beat in my early days was also where the campus, the university radio station, became a platform for me and for my work. Uh, by, by milling around the halls of the radio station, I met the guys that did Street Beat, so that's the hip hop show on Friday night. And once I started reading poems out in the community, uh, they were like, dude, you should come read some on the air. So, and then, of course, my good friend Katie over at the Children's Hour had me on many times, most notably when my children's book came out. And so, really, that institution was like my first, hey, kid, you're in town you do something that's pretty cool, how do we let other people know about it? And that was really the beginning of UNM, helping me get myself and my work out there. Uh, I came in as a CNJ student, and, uh, and I'm gonna go a couple, forward a couple slides. Came in as a CNJ student, and when I came here in the, I came as a December admit, admit so I came like in the middle of the school year, right, and uh, I was running up and down the halls of the CNJ building trying to keep my newly minted graduate schedule of classes, and so they were also instrumental in kind of saying as I began to write and teachers began to know who I was, hey, how do we, how do we plug you in to some things around the community? But I really, really KUNM was the first part. And then the second part was when I started showing up at the Black History Month brunch, which is coming up. And so for a number of years, after it was probably my second or third year after, after we won the National Poetry Slam, and I'll get back to that, where they were like, hey, we do this brunch. Uh, the African-American community definitely needs to know who you are as a, as a black face that's recognizable in the community. So we're going to sit you up on some of these panels and put you up on, on some of these uh, dioceses. I don't think that's the plural of diocese. Dais, <laughs> right? Dais. But the first time I actually got to speak at Martin Luther King, excuse me, uh, Black History Month brunch at UNM, I was sitting next to the only woman ever to chair the Black Panther Party. So yeah, that made me nervous. I was a nervous wreck <laughs> that day, because if you ever met Elaine Brown, she's, she's an intimidating woman, right? And I sat literally right next to her, like I passed the salt to her, and, uh, and, and had to like give a poem before she came up and spoke so eloquently about, about their legacy, and later having for a short time the Black Panther uh, uh, archives here. But that was another time that UNM was like, how do we create a platform for you? How do we help you get your voice out there? A couple years later, uh, we had the late, the recently deceased Dick Gregory come through, and uh, I got to be on a panel with him as we were talking about just like intergenerational activism. And so none of those opportunities happen for me unless I'm a student here at UNM. And so it's one thing to write poems, it's another thing to write poems if no one hears them. And these were the opportunities, the first opportunities for me to get my work out there. So before I move on from there, a poem. This poem actually was written in uh, memoriam of Dick Gregory, and I was fortunate enough to get it published in a, in a journal um, called Rattle, which is like, if, you, if you're a poet, Rattle's a pretty big deal, and I've been trying to get published by them for years, no response, not even a rejection letter, I wasn't even worth that, and then, uh, and then they have this other thing called uh, um, Poets Respond, and they were trying to 
bring back this tradition of poets writing about contemporary issues, because you know, it's, 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 it's common in academia, especially to valorize the poets of yesteryear, but how do you get poets who are commenting on what's happening today, right? And so uh, this poem was actually selected to be published in Rattle shortly after Dick Gregory's death. Dick Gregory. You said war was a joke, except you meant it. Not a mean bone in your body. All funny bones made it harder to break you. Served your country for 82 years, minus the two you spent in the military. Served your country a plate of mirrors and told us to smile. Served black people a glass of ourselves and told us to drink up if we were still hungry. Thank you. It, and I grew, so my mom was one of my biggest literary influences. She got me my first book of poems by Khalil Gibran. Uh, she also bought me Dick Gregory's book, N-Word. And, uh, and so I grew up knowing that Dick Gregory was a diet and a guy that wrote this, this really sharp critique of what it is to be black in America. I was a little, he, his comedy years had kind of evolved into a bigger civil rights icon by the time I came along, but it was special for me to write that because it was like, now I can connect back to that legacy that my mom gave me, so thanks for liking it. Um, fast forward, moving right along. Then uh, CNJ department as I kind of advanced in my studies, um, and I should back up, because I already skipped something. In 2005, we won the National Poetry Slam. Albuquerque won the National Poetry Slam. I was on the National Poetry Slam team in 2005. It was eight months after I arrived here on MLK Day. My first slam was a month after I arrived here on MLK Day. Uh, I did pretty good at that slam and I qualified for the city team. Uh, later the city named me city champ, which was awesome. But before that, I was the Lobo Slam champ. So you, like, you, some of you might know my friend Rowie. She's a great, she's a great uh, indigenous poet. But uh, Lobo Slam has a long and storied tradition especially on this campus. Uh, at the time, we were kind of just like the other slam for the young kids uh, because the, the adult slam community were holding slams in bars and places where people who weren't 21 could get in. So Lobo Slam was kind of created out of necessity. Um, there was a slam at Winnings Coffee Shop, which still persists to this day, which is actually, um, actually Poetry and Beer is our longest running slam. So the Winning Slam is probably one of the second longest running slams in our community. But it was also a little bit segregated by age by like older community poets, people with jobs and kids. And then if you came in there as a youngster and you read a poem about being young, maybe the audience didn't connect so much because they hadn't been young in a long time. <laughs> so, so we created a space where those poems would be competitive with other people who could relate to your work. And um, that space actually competes with other colleges from around the country and something that looks a lot like March Madness. Uh, they call it the College Union Poetry Slam Invitational. Um, back then, they, were, they would allow any school to have a slam team, and it could include faculty and grad students. So I was a grad student, so I was able to make the Lobo Slam team. And so before um, we actually ever had a lot of success as a city on the national scene, we were, we were grooming a new crop of young poets, and I literally just moved here at the right time to be part of it. Later, we, you know, good things happened for us. We got to go tour, read poems in lots of places around the country as a result of winning the National Poetry Slam. We went back to Cupsie. Uh, I think I was on two more college Lobo Slam teams after that where we represented UNM. Uh, we were always a little upset that UNM athletics didn't, didn't take as much pride in our national championship as they do in some of the other national championships, but it's kind of like being on debate team, right? So, so but we kept, we, we carried on, right? And so for the next two years, we placed very well in the College Union Poetry. We didn't repeat, but we always made it to finals. Uh, we felt like that was good for UNM. We hope it brought, brought some young writers here. Uh, but shortly after that, we rechristened the Communications and Journalism building. It was going through a, a renovation when I first started there, and then it arrived. And so uh, some people who were really important to my development as a human, uh, Dr. Ilya Rodriguez, who was my thesis chair, uh, she spoke to, I think at the time it was John Etzel, later it was Karen Foss, it was uh, Glenda Ballas, those were all of the chairs of the communications department during my time there, and they all were like, how do we use you? Like poets, poetry is like this awkward square peg that you're always trying to fit in a circle hole, especially at city events, more about that later when you're a poet laureate, but, but the, the university was really good about trying to find spaces to help, uh, to help 
me showcase more. And so when we christened this building, which I spent a whole lot of time in, um, it was kind of special to be a part of that, right? And that was kind of my first christening, spoiler alert, fast forward to the Karen Abrams Courtyard at UNM, right? Then I'm doing poetry out in the community for a little while and this thing pops up. Uh, this show at New Mexico PBS, also KNME, also the university TV station, uh, they're looking for a new host. Um, Caloris has a long and storied tradition way before I came as an arts interview program that was an opportunity for us artists who oftentimes get a blurb here or there in the paper to really sit down in, in long form, 60 minute style, talk about our passion for creating art. Not so much event based, but just like, why do you do what you do? And so it is a, it's totally an art nerd program, right up my alley, my cup of tea. And I'd known about it even before uh, I, Michael Kamins, the producer there, invited me to come be their in-studio host. And so to this day, now three or four years later, um, when we do in-studio interviews, uh, we, and we have a cadre of people. You might know uh, Megan Kamarek, uh, Sarah Gustavus, lots of other people do interviews there, but for a long time it was just me. And if, if they shot it more documentary style and they didn't have a host and they did it on site, they didn't need me, but whenever they, they had someone in the studio, I got to do what I like to do, which is be curious and ask questions. And so uh, that actually was a huge for my visibility. And I feel like that was the thing that kind of put me in different conversations later, like the Define UNM campaign, when they were looking for, for a voice for the kind of rebrand of the university. And time for another poem. So one of my favorite Caloris programs was when we interviewed Larry Mitchell. You guys know who Larry Mitchell is? Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, Award-winning musician, uh, man in, black man in black, I call him, because I think Johnny Cash already took man in black. Um, <laughs> so, and he uh, always wears his hat, right? Um, and so for his episode, uh, my producer, Tara Walsh, was like, hey, it would be awesome if when we do like the whole show them doing their art part that you and him improvise live and, and do something. And I was terrified to improvise live at that point, so I was like, I'll write something. And so, and then he played, <laughs> he played the guitar with his pedals and his amp and his looper. And um, this is what I wrote for that poem that we did together. It's called Your Truth. If there is truth in truth, and it's true, that the heart is the size of a fist, when you open it up, it looks like this. If it's true what they say about hearts, when you put two together, do they beat box? Is it true that they inflate and flutter from time to time when the heart of another girl or guy enter the room? I heard that 4-4, four, four, that thump thump, that beat bop, that boom bap. I hear that if you put your hand, excuse me, I hear that if you put your heart in your hand, off your sleeve, and up to your ear, it sounds like you're sure. It will sound like you are sure. I can hear a heart stop like a heart attack at first sight, like Cupid arrest, arrow to your chest. As you put both fist-shaped hearts in the sky, like, ho, oh, like you're the neighbor and there is a fist-shaped party in your chest beating you to death. If it's true that the heart is the size of the fist, when you open it up, it looks like help. It looks like high and high fives, like a good poker face that will never beat a pair of hearts with hinges that bend but don't break or go broke because a pair of open hearts is the exact same size as a patty cake or a handshake or the wingtips at the end of a hug. So fold, our ten or so fold all ten or so of your fingers and embrace the person next to you because an open hand is the same size as an open seat if it's you. And if the truth is true, then it's most definitely you. Thank you. Thank you. So then um, I did a couple of other things. I had a children's book come out, which was really awesome. I think that that was a huge opportunity. And, and ironically, I didn't include him in his presentation, but my connection to Alex Paramo of Community Publishing uh, actually came through UNM as well because he used to work here in the web development team at UNM and so we met through kind of musical circles but when we first sat down for coffee we didn't actually know each other we had known each other through friends and the first thing he said for me said to me um, don't tell anyone outside this room this is he was like I'm leaving my job at UNM to start a publishing company and I was like do you need help 
So, <laughs> so he was like, yeah, I need, I need ideas for a children's book. And I was like, well, I have a poem I wrote for my son's school that I literally wrote because I was going to do a residency. This was in the lean in between times. Like I, I had uh, quit my job at Media Literacy Project after I became Poet Laureate. And then uh, my parents thought I was crazy. And I didn't have a job because I was going to make it as an artist. And, and I did it for two years, but I needed gigs. And so the principal at Christina Kent uh, Early Childhood Center um, came to me and said, hey, you should come do workshops with our parents and with our students. And I was like, yes, because I needed money. And then I went home and was like, I don't have any poems that are appropriate for kindergartners, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, so, so I went and wrote poems appropriate for kindergartners. And one of them became a children's book. But that was pretty much Alex's doing afterwards, because he was like, you got to have something that's, that we could illustrate. And I was like, yeah, I got this poem I wrote for my son's school. So um, fast forward to now, right? Um, just last year, UNM had a rebranding campaign. And I actually had no idea what I was getting myself into. I knew that they were paying me pretty well for my voice, um, because there were negotiations with my talent manager, Amanda Sutton, um, from West End Press, who published my book. And I was and actually published by West End Press, distributed by UNM Press, so there's another UNM connection. But I was getting these phone calls, and they were like, you're a finalist for this branding campaign, and they, they, want, they want your voice. I literally was at an event in Seattle um, for Westaff, Western States Arts Federation, and Amanda's calling me in my hotel room, and she's like, you need to send them a recording of your voice, like ASAP stat. And so I was like, how do I do that? She was like, download this app. I downloaded an app in my hotel room. I'm talking, I'm reading this script into a phone. And then two weeks later, they say they picked you, right? And so they picked me for 1690, I think they are. Um, they're out of Philadelphia. They're an international marketing company. They got hired or contracted to do the UNM rebrand. Um, I went in and read this poem that they'd they wrote the poem, actually. I know a lot of people hear the campaign, they're like, that was a great poem. I didn't write it. They wrote it. <laughs> but, uh, but I did voice it, and I was able to give feedback in the booth, like, this would sound better, or I could say this better if you guys just nipped it and tucked it here. Um, they gave me my undisclosed amount of money. And then, <laughs> and then I was in a Cottonwood Mall, and I started seeing the, the lines from the poem in Define UNM. And then I started, and then they sent me the spot. And then it was Super Bowl Sunday last year. Yeah, last year, right? Deja vu because the Patriots were in it again. And, uh, sorry, I'm an Eagles fan. You, you have to put up with that. I'm from Philadelphia. <laughs> so so I, I'm going to my friend's house. Uh, actually, my son is with me. And I start getting all these texts. And everybody's like, dude, I think I heard your voice during the Super Bowl. I think I heard your voice during the Super Bowl. And I was like, nah, -uh, stop. Like, yeah, anyway, I was there Super Bowl, right? <laughs> then, then literally the, the communications team on Monday shoots me back and they were like, yeah, we aired our, our dad during the Super Bowl. So I was like, mom, did you hear my voice during the Super Bowl? And they were like, we didn't air it in the national market, you dummy. We just aired it in our market. I was like, dang. Almost famous. <laughs> Almost famous. <laughs> But it was, it, was really, it was really a huge opportunity for me. I was invited back to do radio spots. You might have heard some of those 15 or 20 seconds on the radio talking about how UNM has one of the top photography programs, talking about our, radio, our rural medicine programs and things like that. Lots of things that I didn't even know I should be proud of, and that, but I am proud of because I'm a Lobo. And so it was nice to be invited back to be part of that campaign. But um, kudos to the UNM Communications and Marketing Department. Um, they couldn't. I don't know if they could stack the deck in my favor, or, or they said a few kind words, but it was a huge opportunity for me, and I was happy to be a part of it. So, Then fast forward through that, through the Karen Abrams dedication, uh, and that was a huge opportunity for me as well. Uh, I was originally approached by uh, one of my mentors, uh, uh, Mr. Lewis, our former treasurer, and he was like, I want you to do this thing for me with freshman students, or they had an award ceremony, and I went and did that, but, she, but he was like, I have this other thing that I really think you'd be great for. And uh, I wasn't lucky enough to be a student of Karen Abrams, but I was lucky enough to get to do a lot of homework on her and really just fell in love with her through this reading about her work. And um, because I'm a journalist, as you saw, that's a lot of my process of how I write. So I get immersed in, in the information and then I wait till the story finds me, right? And the story that found me about K Karen was just about um, her generosity. It was about her general going above and beyond the call of duty for so many years for this university. And um, I almost cried when I read it because, you know, she's striking. So she's like over here in the corner and I'm like doing this the whole time, looking at her to make sure she doesn't frown. And, uh, and then uh, she comes up to me afterwards and she was just like, I really love your poem. And so I, she felt, she made me feel like 
I had said the right thing. And so, um, but those kind of opportunities are huge because without that, I don't get to be in front of you today, right? And so many of, many of the alumni were there for that who um, didn't see me bouncing around campus at all these things because you guys are off living your lives like Mr. Campbell, right? And so, but when they have alumni events, that's an opportunity for me to connect with another generation of Lobos. And, and that's a big deal for me because without y'all, there's no me, right? And so just this past uh, spring, was it spring or fall, spring? I, days are running together. The Black Alumni Association also gave me um, an award for just, you know, being black in Albuquerque. <laughs> so, like, you know. But, but, and I say that as a joke, I say that as a joke. But, but also, you know, it's, I just said to you guys when I came in, it's nice to be recognized by your community. Uh, furthermore, like this is my micro community. And so for them to give me an award and say, that generally just says, hey kid, keep doing what you're doing, um, is huge. Because a lot of times when you're just in your head down, trying to, to get the things on time, trying to feed my son and, and I have to drop him off at his mom's and then I have to eat and then get to another event, it gets really small. The world gets really small and it's nice to know that people from afar see you struggling and they just want to give you some encouragement to keep on doing it. So that was a huge reward, not just because it was the Black Alumni Association, but because of the other, other honorees I was being um, recognized with that evening that accomplished way more than me. And so it was a huge, a huge, um, a huge feather for me in my heart. So thank you to the, to the Black Alumni Association. And so to you all, I say, you know, keep calm and Lobo on, right? <laughs> and that's, that's, that's what I've been trying to do. And it's nice that if you, my timeline, I didn't include dates there, but like every two or so years, I mean, I get an opportunity that I don't think I get unless I'm connected to this Lobo family. Um, and, and thank you, I thank you for that. So I'm um, gonna end with a poem, um, I, something I kind of glossed over because I think it, it kind of connected a lot of the work that I had been doing at the city around rebranding of downtown, trying to get downtown to be more attractive to um, young families and people that we want to, to live there and populate it and take ownership of it. And so I was part of this campaign called uh, We Are This City. And as a result, I got to write something called the ABQ Manifesto, um, which always feels a little bit obnoxious because I wasn't born here. So becoming poet laureate felt obnoxious because I wasn't born here either. But it was like, can you capture maybe the spirit of the community um, for, and then we can use it as a way to attract people to downtown. We had modeled it on some things that had been done in Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs has a manifesto for their city. It was artfully created by a team of writers and poets to kind of say, how do we kind of say who we are in a way that invokes pride in the people in this area? Um, and then we kind of borrowed some cues from a good friend of mine, Ken Arkine in Denver. He's a slam poet, and he got hired and paid way more money than I ever did to do, um, to do the uh, Denver Nuggets. So they have a thing for the Denver that they play on the Jumbotron. And since, you know, poetry is in or was in circa two or three years ago, uh, that he got to be the guy to voice that. But it was about Denver pride. And it was like this idea of a mile high city, even though technically we are higher than Denver. <laughs> I got a chip on my shoulder about it. I'm sorry. I always, I, I always bring that up. I always bring it up. If you're from Denver, I'm sorry. We just didn't feel like we had to call it that, but, <laughs> but it's okay. So this poem is called, uh, um, I call it We Be, but it's the ABQ Manifesto. We be a bucket of Rio, two handfuls of mesa, an open box full of God between the sandias and the volcanoes, our name is mud. We be close enough to heaven and clear enough of sky for the creator to mouth to mouth us alive. We make dirty the new immaculate, make car washes obsolete. We be urban farmhands, rural app developers, be the best brewed beans and micro brew in a six mesa radius in a hundred manana radius. We be coffee shop crushes and conversations. We be the creme de la creatives. We powder with pollen and monsoon foundation for makeup on a rare occasion that we make up only when a winter white tablecloths the mesa. We be aquifers of brown golds. We be the same colored souls. We be an open heart horizon, transplants, land grants, and colonial survivors. We be of the earth and out of this world. 
At the same time, we inherit this pride, this keep it real estate of intellectual property. We B Q U E R Q U E A, we be sunset so beautiful they paint themselves on the edge of the earth. We be where dreams come to live and retire. We be artists making careers out of thin air. We be made up words like sunport because <laughs> stars gotta land somewhere because the center of the universe has got to be somewhere because even the sun has a vacation home in New Mexico. <laughs> we be made upwards, not downwards like mountaintops. We be adobe inside and out. We might look like armored vegetarians but on the inside. We be the coolest gotas you'll ever meet. We be entrepreneurs and doers. Somewhere between bright idea and done and done. We be Chile by blood and balloons for lungs. We be no I in team, but two in familia. We be full moons and photosynthesis, not a cloud to be found. We be radiant, worshiping the sky with hand signs at 505, letting our unidentified flying cousins know that we out here fighting for our light. We be loco, we be loco, we be lobo, singing to the night. We are your favorite city's favorite city, the heart of the Southwest, leaning just a little to the left in New Mexico's chest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's for you, Albuquerque. So questions, Q&A, talk to me. How you guys doing? Good? OK, good, thanks. Uh, I, 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 maybe I, I don't hope it wasn't falsely advertised. I, could, I, I have more poems, but I want to keep our time to where it should be. Um, I will add that the book that um, UNM has here today from UNM Press is nice. <laughs> I was younger when I wrote it, so be gentle with the poems. I have a, I have a, a new uh, book of poems come out on Tuesday at Bookworks, if you're so inclined to come around. I share that book with my most frequent creative partner, Carlos Contreras, and also a UNM grad, also in actually in grad school here right now at UNM. Um, and that's a whole other part of the story that I left out for time. I used to teach in Chicano studies here at UNM as well. So. Um, What does that mean? Well, that's a great question because applications are open right now. <laughs> you, in, in June of this year, as opposed to April, we typically crown the Poet Laureate for the city in April. Um, on, uh, it's a biannual position, so every two years we crown the Poet Laureate. But we moved it to align more with the city's fiscal calendar to June. So in June of this year, you will get to meet your fourth Poet Laureate. I was the first. Jessica Helen Lopez was your second Poet Laureate. And Manuel Gonzalez is your current Poet Laureate. But the application window is open now. It is a nominations-based process. So if you go to Albert, uh, if I get this right, Albuquerque Poet Laureate Program.org, or if you just Google APLP, Albuquerque Poet Laureate Program, it'll bring you to the site and you can see the nomination process and submit. You can nominate yourself. Um, so let people know. I, I always say it's nice to check with the person if they want to be nominated or not because if, if, we, if you nominate them, it triggers the process. And the process means they have to submit 15 pages of work. They have to submit two proposals for community projects, one with a $5,000 budget and one with a $1,000 budget um, and a writing resume. The only real requirement, though, is that they have to have been here as a New Mexico resident for five years or as an Albuquerque resident for five years. And so that's the only thing that would disqualify you but not having an MFA doesn't disqualify you. And the committee that chooses the Poet Laureate is a community uh, selection committee. It's not the Poet Laureate program. The people who run the program run the program, right? But the selection committee is, often, is always pulled from the community. It includes somebody from the publishing community, somebody from the academic writing community, somebody from a literature-oriented nonprofit, another poet who's not in the running to be Poet Laureate, and a youth representative that's under 21. And so all of those five people have to go away uh, on the mountaintop and unanimously agree on the Poet Laureate every, every two years. Could you speak a little bit about your process in terms of not only the writing, but also the, the, way, you, the way you found it 
decided how to perform it? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, they're separate processes, right? So the, the writing is kind of just being observant. Uh, and I know it sounds trite and rote, but I feel like most poets like to watch and listen. Like they, they, they people watch, right? You know, I do it through conversation. I'm a Gemini, New Jersey guy. I like to talk. Other people don't talk as much. But either way, like whenever you're in a conversation with me, be careful because it could end up in a poem, right? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> be careful. Uh, I reserve the right to use what you said against you. So, <laughs> so, so that actually comes from my journalism background, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> but I feel like it's a lot of capturing ideas. For me, that's just my thought process is I, I organize my th thoughts through writing. Some people do it through playing music. Some people do it through journaling, which is writing, but not necessarily poetry because I journal as well, but that's a very separate process. Usually a poem is something that just won't let me go. And, and, and this many years later, I know when it's a poem, when, it come, when it's not, because I, I do music as well. I'm an MC, come from the hip hop generation. So when it comes in my head, I was like, ooh, that's a rap. That's a short story. Mm, this maybe is an op-ed or submit it to Medium or Huffington Post, it's not a poem. But when it's a poem, it kind of tells me that, it, that it's a poem. Um, and then it's just really the luck of the draw, whether I complete it or not. There's thousands of begun, begun poems that just don't get the attention because of soccer practice or, or something else. Um, now, once I have a treasure trove of poems, the ones that get to be performed either are mandated because I have a deadline, especially when you're poet laureate. A lot of them are commissioned, so it's gonna be performed. Ready or not, here it comes, right? Like, you know, um, which I think that my journalism background prepared me for. Like, writing on deadline is a unique skill that I think a lot of people who get to be in a laureate position, um, if you're not ready for that part, that can be the most intimidating part. Um, Writing poems when they come to you out of inspiration is awesome if you get that luxury, right? Otherwise, it is pretty deadline oriented, right? You can have a practice of writing and you should, but it's still very deadline oriented. Usually, the poems that end up getting read are the poems that feel urgent to me. And I figure out how to perform them through reading them, you know? I do a lot of reading in my apartment. My neighbors get upset. I live in, I live in this old, like, and usually that's way late at night, <laughs> you know? But that's where I'm trying to find out the rhythm of the poem. I record my poems. So I record it, this also helps me with memorization. So I read it into whatever, a, a, a voice recorder, and then I'll listen to it in my car. And usually I'm editing there. That's when I'm editing performance and not editing the words anymore. But I'm like, mm, that didn't come off well, or that part is too cramped, give some space and some air there. And the physical choreography usually just makes itself up through repertoire, through rep, you know. And so the first time I perform a poem, meh. The hundredth time I perform a poem, it's getting there. It's getting there. But by then I'm tired of it, so then it might be, <laughs> you know, my set list, it changes a lot, so, yeah. How, how can we follow you? Um, I'm parked right out here, no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a smart, you know what. Um, I have a website, Hakeem B, uh, my le the first two letters of my last name, so H-A-K-I-M-B-E dot com. Um, they'll come up in a Google search. Uh, I also uh, have, I'm on all the social media platforms except Facebook. I took a Facebook fast New Year's Day of 2016, and I haven't been able to bring myself to get back on here in, this far into 2017, so we'll see. <laughs> so, I'm still, I'm still, I have a presence on there. It's like my, my um, artist page, but it's not, I don't have to manage that, so I don't have to log in too often there. But those will all tell you where gigs are happening, and it's kind of where I announce the bigger news, like what I shared with you guys, the book release on Tuesday. There, I saw in the back first, and then I'll come here. Yes. I kind of wanted to ask, um, how much of all this is on your poetry and how much of it is about your position as a politics worker in your world? Absolutely. Uh, and and I, say it, I say it like, let me say it like this. As a, I've been writing now, or calling myself a poet now for about 12 years, right? 13 years if you count that first year, but I don't really count that first year, right? <laughs> and and I, would always, I was always curious why, you know, Walt Whitman gets to be a great American poet and Langston Hughes gets to be a great black American poet. And uh, I still struggle with that question because I want to be known for my work, right? Um, I want to be known for my work regardless of whether um, you think the messenger is or isn't authentic, right? And so I feel like um, anything I write is politicized because a black man's writing it. There was a time when writing and reading in this country was a political act for black people, right? Because it was illegal, right? 
But I am explicitly political as well because I come from a news background. That's where I found lots of my early inspiration in my early poems. And so when I get stuck, I kind of still go there. It's easy for me to tune into Twitter and find something to write about, right? Uh, I feel like I've expanded my repertoire when I became a dad. My son's 10 now. And so there are certain kind of personal poems that I write that I don't think I wrote those early in my career. It was easier to write political things because if you didn't like the poem, you didn't like my politics. When I write a personal thing, if you don't like the poem, you don't like me. And that's, that takes a lot more bravery. Like the political poems I wrote, I was trying to prove how smart I was, which is a thing for liberals, right? So, <laughs> so but um, when I became, when I became, when I, when I started writing more personal poems, like even the first poem I read tonight, like chronometrophobia is a funny poem, but it's a lot into, you know, if you're someone who's chronically late, people who love you very much make you feel bad about it all the time. And so it was a, it, I, that was probably one of the first vulnerable poems I wrote. I mean, I think they're helping, that, especially if they're your parents, right? Like, <laughs> like, you know, but, but, and they were my parents, actually. My dad was Marine, so he was on time every time, right? But I think that I've started to expand that. And now I think where I try to find as a writer is a happy medium. Like, if I want to write about political things, I don't want to write diatribe anymore. Um, I want to write about it from a personal connection, even if it's not my personal story. There was a hand up. Yeah, uh, who are some of the local artists, uh, poets, or otherwise um, that you think we should be paying attention to? Oh, for sure. So uh, you have a UNM alumnus because I was on her graduation committee, uh, Mercedes Holtry. Mercedes Holtry. Uh, she just graduated from UNM, right? She's been our city champ, I don't know, like three years running now. I've kind of had to step back from the, from the slam scene because like, I'm a dad, <laughs> but, but um, my weeknights are spoken for most times. But she's amazing and she's actually getting ready to go on her first book tour. She's taking over uh, the youth poetry program at Warehouse 508. So I just really think in a tradition, like I'm, I find myself in a tradition of my poetry mentors, like Ken Rodriguez and Don McIver. And when I started slamming, they were the ones that took me into the schools. They were like, we're gonna show you how to do a workshop with young people that's not gonna get you or them in trouble, right? You know, <laughs> we're gonna show you like, how, to, how to do this right, right? And I feel like Mercedes right now carries on that tradition very well. Like, and she, and she's, she needs your support, frankly, as a young writer. All, all writers need your support, but young writers especially. A little bit older than her, one of my favorite poets in town is Damian Flores. He's an amazing writer, he's funny. His poetry is, uh, is just really authentic to New Mexico. Um, his story tell, he's in a, he writes in a storytelling tradition of New Mexico. Um, I'm partial to my, my homie Carlos because him and I both write in a very hip hop aesthetic, lots of rhythm, lots of rhyme based things in our work, definitely on contemporary topics because if, if it's not talking about contemporary topics, it's not hip hop, right? Um, because that's, that's the tradition that hip hop was born out of. Um, who else? My, of course, my. My successor, Jessica Helen Lopez, she's one of the best writers in the nation, if you ask me, <laughs> if you ask me. Um, people from the non-slam community that I really admire locally, um, Michelle Otero, if you've never seen her work, it's amazing. She's an actress, so a lot of her work presents very theatrically. Um, Andrea Serrano, who's like, I would call her like the compliment to Damian Flores in that she's so Albuquerque, like her writing is so Albuquerque, and when you read their stuff, you, it, it tastes like Rudolfo and Aya, just how they talk, the voice in it, in their work, it has that like unmistakable New Mexico flavor, and, and those are just some. There's many more, so. Others? No? There's a hand, yes, I see. Who do I read that's not? So right now I'm reading a guy named Marcus Walker. If you don't know who he is, check out his book. He was a Cave Canem poet. So Cave, for, for black American poets, that's like the clearinghouse. If you want to make it and get to the next level, generally you want to get recognized by Cave Canem. Uh, many people from the Dark Room Collective, which is a modern poetic movement. Like we think of uh, Amiri Baraka and Nikki Giovanni, they're from the black arts movement. But a more modern movement, is, I, I would say the, the the, those who inherited their legacy are the Dark Room Collective, and those are people like Major Jackson, um, uh, Thomas Sayers Ellis, uh, Natasha Trethaway, who was two poet, national poet laureates ago. Um, so it was, right now we have Tracy K. Smith, who was actually a Cave Canem fellow as well. Before her, we had Juan Felipe Herrera out of Southern California, and before her, we had Natasha Trethaway out of Georgia. She's actually from New Orleans, from Louisiana, but teaches at Emory University in Georgia, and, and she's part of Dark Room Collective. So I feel like I'm 
desperately trying to grow up to be like them. They would be like the literary movement that I would aspire to, even though I still, I still admire, like I got to meet Amiri Baraka a few times before he passed. I got to meet Nikki Giovanni, uh, thanks to Amanda Sutton, my publisher of Bookworks. But I feel like this movement is a little more closer to where I'm at now. Um, people who don't really identify with that movement, who are kind of like in the nether region between the two years, are people like Claudia Rankin. If you've never read Citizen, get on Amazon right now and get it. Don't get on Amazon. Go to UNM Bookstore <laughs> or, to, or to Bookworks and get it. Citizen is like, I don't know, she made, she made a leap in how even poetry is presented because it reads margin to margin. You don't even know if you're reading a poem when you're done, but you're just like, Bleh. so. Who else? Yes, son. What's your question? You don't have a question? His question is, is it time to go yet, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Aw, oh, you're sweet. Is that all right with y'all? Can I do one more? Okay. I'm standing between y'all and the, I saw sugar cookies. My son had sugar cookies, so you don't want to be the guy that stands between the hungry people and their sugar cookies. That's not a good look. I did, I did have one for tonight, and I was like, nah, I'm going to skip that one, so uh, let's break it out. So, and thank you for the laureate question. I feel like, I know I kind of glossed over that, but when I was preparing my talk, I was like, what are all the things I did that's connected to UNM? And uh, tangentially, yes, right? I don't, I don't get to be in that conversation either unless people know my work from the first half of this presentation, right? And a lot of that was what... I don't know, you have to have a body of work to even be considered, and a lot of that body of work was created through things like this, right? So this poem was actually the poem that I wrote for the centennial. It's a little long in the tooth, so I hope you really meant for me to read one more. Uh, <coughs> Dick Gregory poem was short. I try to throw short ones at you, right? Um, and uh, it was written on, on, for the anniversary of the centennial which was another kind of awkward space to be in because it was before uh, the public would know that I would be Poet Laureate. Um, I n actually, you know what? Scratch that. When Mayor Barry asked me to write the centennial poem for Summerfest, uh, I was going to present it after Robert Mirabal and before Los Lobos to the largest crowd I've ever presented a poem to. If you remember, uh, if you were there, there were, like it was Holly Home Parade status, right? <laughs> on, a, on, a, on the plaza. Uh, I, I don't think I was quite prepared for that. And that, none of that even entered my mind when I was writing it because when the mayor asked me, it was um, in December of that year. And uh, I was flying home because I was like, what am I gonna write about? So I sought counsel with some of my uh, closest mentors. I asked Damien, I asked Jazz Cuffey, who's another poet locally. If you don't know Jazz Cuffey, she's an amazing poet. I asked her mom, and at the time, her, her, her grandmother and grandfather, her late grandfather, about you know, I've been asked to write a poem for the 100th anniversary of New Mexico, and at the time I lived here five years, exactly, um, and I was like, I don't know, I'm kind of scared, because you know how y'all are, New Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> if this poem ain't right, I might not make it off the stage, right? Like, you know, so, um, and I definitely don't want to come in here with the outsider, colonizer, you know, uh, thing, so what should I write about? Like, I, I, I did what I knew how to do. I became a journalist. I asked, I interviewed people, I asked questions, and uh, one of the, I guess most, the biggest influences that I spoke to was Levi Dometo, who actually teaches here. He was on my thesis committee because you're allowed to have one outside department member on your thesis committee. So Levi was mine. Um, Levi's done so much for the SLAM community by bringing the SLAM community, us little street poets from the corner, and giving us a space inside the university, inside the ivory tower. He was the teacher because you have to have a, a faculty member if you're going to have a club. So that's how you got Lobo SLAM. It was Levi Dometo, right? And so Levi, took me to Los Compadres when it was down there by the zoo, because that's where he liked to eat. He was like, yeah, I'll meet with you, Akeem, but you're going to buy me breakfast. Yes, sir. <laughs> I go down there. Levi, I, I'm trying to talk, ask him, like, I got this poem to write. What should I write about? He does this whole Yoda thing. So for an hour, we're talking about his mom, land grants where he grew up, and things that are happening down by the river. And he actually grew up in Dixon, right, New Mexico. Um, and then, like, an hour later, he's got to leave. And he was like, oh, you had to ask me something, right? And I was like, yeah, I'm trying to write the centennial poem, and I need your help. What, do you, what advice do you have for me? And he was like, oh, yeah, I had something for you. And he leans into his booth, and he brings me a stack of books this big. <laughs> and he was like, read some of those, and that'll help you out. He's like, but the first thing, he's like, but the first thing you should do 
is, is interview people and find out what New Mexicans who've lived here for a long time think about us turning 100 years old. And so I had already started to do that. I didn't tell him that, but I interviewed more people and I read his books. And one of the most profound books was this book on corridos, this idea of folk songs that tell the story of a place. And I was fascinated with that because I grew up in New Jersey. They don't exactly teach you about corridos in South Jersey folklore history, <laughs> right, class, right? And so I said, you know, I'm a songwriter and I want to write something that feels like a corrido. And so that's what I attempted to do. You guys would tell me whether it worked or not. I will say this, when I presented it on the stage uh, in front of that audience, I wanted to be clear that celebrating 100 years of statehood is awesome. There were people that lived here before us, and, for, and, and, and only with their permission do I read this poem. So. 100 Years of Corridos, a song for the New Mexico Centennial. In the first chapter of the Gospel according to Anaya, Rudolfo writes, all of the older people spoke only Spanish, and I myself understood only Spanish and English. Bienvenido, Salvacorque. I myself only understand English in Diné. We speak many languages but mean the same thing, and mañana will mean more of the same. Familia, food, fiesta, forever. Come on and sing along, we're going to familia, comida, fiesta, forever. For 100 years BC, before the Commodores, before Lionel Richie, and for 100 years more, we farmed, feasted, and fixed cars. We've moved people and mixed razas. We've got an appointment with the curandera as soon as we leave the doctors a lust for livestock like chupacabras, afraid of God and the inexplicable, dinosaur fossils, so in love with space and the people who live there that we speak Chewbacca. <laughs> I didn't do that in front of the mayor, but I do it for y'all. <laughs> the 47th state admitted to the union, we might as well have been the moon of Endor to our forefathers. With the oldest and highest state capital in the country, people on both coasts should look up to us instead of wondering if they have to exchange their money before coming. <laughs> yes, dollars is our official currency too. And though we don't have much of it, money can't buy cultura. Our history book, the King Alfonso version, is a canon of wars and peace, a Bible of you and me that was written in Madrid by missionaries and mestizos. We are men of magic and women of wizardry who speak in spell and song. Wing words and fly them like a flag, all yellow between red and green like a traffic light, like the state question is hurry up or slow down, never stop. All of the older people sung only corridos. However, in those corridos, me, I only heard gospel. Maybe it's me, maybe it's a stage, but every time I hear the clap of thunder, it sounds like a blessing. Every time I hear the pitter patter of rain, it sounds like a round of applause. And even the moon roars encore as the flash bloods flood our hearts with love. After 100 New Year's Eves of trying to puncture precipitation, where the sky never dies and the clouds wear bulletproof vests, where we perpetually live in a shadow of a hot air balloon eclipse. We are not a city that speaks good morning. We are a city that speaks mass ascension. Like grandpa only spoke Spanish when he was drinking buenos dias. Like grandma only spoke Latin when she was praying buenas noches, where water is so sacred and scarce that we pot it in puddles on our flat roofs, pool it in vestibule stoops of steeple temples where pigeons swirl and roost, pond it in mountaintops on our not-so-flat horizons where we bottle it in our bodies and then set fire to it in our forests where it sounds like a sequia's babble, amen. And bosques smell like baptisms where the rain doesn't speak any language, it only understands dance. And sometimes we miss it so much, we need two rainbows to promise us it is coming back. 
after thousands of years of owners for this little piece of hacienda. It's been us as tenants together, roommates for the past hundred. Call it a trust. Call it a Zia-shaped symbol for eternity over our right ring finger. Call it the interconnectedness of cultures. Call it married to each other. Speak now or forever hold your chisme. <laughs> we are actions speak louder than wordsmiths. Storytelling rituals. We don't speak project runway. We cowboy cosmopolitan, urban, traditional, where our children dare not say or see kakui or la llorona, but our lucky Santa speaks Spanglish and has a sweet tooth for leche bizcochitos, <laughs> where birthdays are miracles and each one has a spirit, Holy Spirit or patron saint, where we celebrate 100 today. In the beginning, the greatest spirit created America and the earth, and it was bueno. I don't speak perfect English, barely even speak passable Spanish, but it's okay, because there's no such thing as perfect English, except for the word Nuevo Mexico. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We just have a, a little token of our appreciation. This was absolutely stunning. Thank you so much. Thank it was you. A pleasure to have you. Thank you, Lobos. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.